bring messages to us, but I'm glad to be back tonight in the pulpit. Over the next uh, few weeks, we're going to take a look at this epistle of James. It's, uh, it's not a very long epistle, it's five chapters. It actually has less total verses than the 119th Psalm. But uh, the book of James is a power-packed book for the child of God. And uh, as, we look at these, as we look at these verses of this book on a Wednesday night Bible study, tonight we're going to start off, Lord willing, and we're going to look at the first 12 verses tonight of the book of James, chapter number 1. The Bible says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which were scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let's bow our heads. Our Father, we thank you for the word tonight. Pray you'd speak to our hearts with it. I thank you, dear Lord, for time of study in this book, and I pray, dear Lord, that you'd help us with the message tonight, in Jesus' name, amen. The book of James is a training manual. You know, you've, you've gone out to jobs, and um, most of the time, uh, whatever you're hired to do, you're going to receive some sort of a, a training manual. Training manuals are great because uh, you don't have to remember everything as long as you got the manual to show you what to do. And uh, I, I know I, our son, Mike, he's, a, he's an aircraft mechanic and he works on these big jets. And I said, how on earth do you remember everything about that? He said, you don't have to remember everything. He said, you have to remember the manual. And he said, if you, if, you memor, if you memorize and learn the manual, he said, you can fix anything. And uh, so I think that's good advice for us as a Christian, taking this book of James, this little letter of James, uh, as a training manual on how to live the Christian life. It was written by James, and there are several James in the Bible. Uh, it's commonly understood and believed that the epistle of James was written by James the Just, or the Lord's half-brother, and uh, he he's writing it, if you'll notice in verse 1, to Jewish Christians, and uh, he's not just writing it to Jews, he's writing it to Jewish Christians, and he tells us that uh, he's writing to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Now, you have to go way back into the Old Testament to learn about the, the dispersion of the nation of Israel it's, uh, back in the 32nd chapter of Deuteronomy. And it talks about how that they will be scattered all around about uh, over the, the world. But also, I want us to know that I think that maybe some of these uh, were also some of the ones of the early church in Jerusalem. Uh, because uh, during the first persecution 
that took place in Acts chapter number 8 and verse number 1, uh, the Bible says that Saul was consenting unto his death, that, that be, the, his death being Stephen's death. And at that time, there was great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Now, I've always um, thought about that, how that in the first chapter of Acts, the Lord uh, told the, the early church or told the apostles that ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. But if you read over in those early chapters of Acts, the church was really growing fast. I mean, if you do the math uh, that's in the Bible, it doesn't take long to understand that it wasn't very long after the church at Jerusalem got going after Pentecost that they, they, they may have had it upwards in numbers of over uh, hundreds, a hundred thousand people that were coming in. I mean, they were being saved in droves. But when the first persecution came along, it says they scattered. Well, I think the Lord did that on purpose because He, he never told the church to get in Jerusalem, stay in Jerusalem, be happy in Jerusalem, and never go past Jerusalem. And so he had to throw a rock in the hornet's nest, so to speak, to get them to scatter abroad to get the, the, the Word of God out to the whole world. And uh, that rock that he used to throw in the hornet's nest was called Saul of Tarsus. And uh, he was the one that got in there and got him stirred up. But anyway, uh, this man James, uh, Paul called him a pillar of the church in Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 9. Now this book, as I said, is, is a training manual. And it's going to teach us a lot of things. There are a lot of lessons uh, that we can learn and we will learn out of the book of James as we study this. And uh, I was noticing as I was studying, I, I, um, uh, I don't preach out of a Schofield Bible, but I've got a, a big Schofield in my office that I do my studying out of. And, and I noticed uh, Dr. Schofield's note said about the book of James that uh, he wrote that the theme of it was an outward religious service as the expression and proof of faith. Uh, James does not exalt works against faith, but faith as producing works. And I think that's a pretty good definition of what the book of James is all about. And so tonight, we're going to look at the first lesson in the training manual. And it's a tough one to learn. Um, not, not, not tough academically to learn, but tough practically to get a hold of, uh, because the first lesson is about testings and trials, or as uh, Schofield would put it, if you have a Schofield Bible laying there in front of you, uh, the heading of it says the purpose of, uh, the purpose of testings, or the purpose of trials, one of those two, one of those two terms. And so we know, we've, we've been taught this all of our Christian life, that that one of the best tests of Christian growth and maturity is trouble. When trouble comes in our life and how we handle that trouble. When a believer goes through personal trials, they discover the kind of faith that they really have. You know, you would never know what kind of faith you have unless it was tested. Now, we, we, saw, we saw terms here in these 12 verses that I read. And that term that we saw was the word temptations. Now understand that we'll learn later on uh, over here in uh, chapter number 1 that God does not tempt man to sin. So when we talk about temptations here in this, this message tonight, we're not talking about tempting to, be sin, to sin, we're talking about having our faith Tested. That's what it's talking about. Or having our faith tried. That's what the word temptation here means. And it's exactly the same principle. The Lord's trying to accomplish the same things that our school teachers did as we were coming through school. Uh, we, would, we would have lessons in school and we would learn uh, a certain amount of material and uh, then the teacher would say, all right, we're going to have a, a quiz and they called them test or quiz or pop quiz, whatever you, want to, whatever you want to call it, it was a test, amen? It was a test. And you, you were put to the test to see how much knowledge that you had retained. 
And, uh, and you, could, uh, you could act like you knew everything and you could pretend like you had studied and all that and n- none of that counts for anything. The test is the proof in the pudding. And uh, when you got your test back, and if it had a big red F on there, then you didn't retain the information very well. And if you had an A, you did a good job at retaining the information. Now that's what the Lord does for us. The Lord has given us His Word. The Lord has given us the Holy Spirit of God uh, to interpret this Word for us. He, he's our God. He's our teacher. Uh, he's our comforter. He's our convictor. And, and everything we know, we get from this book right here, and we get it through the Holy Spirit. And the way that we grow as a Christian is putting faith in what the Spirit of God reveals to us in His Word. And then as we amass this knowledge, we don't amass it just for the sake of amassing knowledge, but we're amassing this knowledge for the purpose of personal growth to be more like Jesus, to be more pleasing unto the Lord. And then from time to time, at the Lord's choosing, we don't have anything to do with it, it's all the Lord's doing, He'll send something in our life to test our faith. He'll test us. He'll he'll see where we are. And believe you me, if if we don't pass the lesson, he's a great remedial teacher. He'll keep teaching it over. He'll teach you till you get it. Amen. He won't give up on you. No, not one time. And so tonight, uh, as we look at overcoming circumstances with the right kind of faith, I titled the message tonight this, Trials and Testings. Training for staying in the fight. We're in a fight. We're not just in a fight, we're in a war. We're in a war against Satan. We're in a war against all of the forces of evil uh, that want to destroy the gospel, uh, that want to try to destroy the Son of God. But most of all, Satan's main goal was to destroy God. And he didn't do that. And God cast him out of heaven. He is already a defeated foe. He won't, won't be a defeated foe. He's already a defeated foe. And uh, he, his destination is the lake of fire. Uh, but, but he doesn't know when and he doesn't know how. But he knows he is because the Lord put the death sentence on him way back in Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 15. And so we see here that we're engaged in a war, the forces of God, the forces of good against the forces of evil. Now, in a war and in a fight, people get hurt and people get wounded. And uh, I was telling you just last week about a man I I buried week before last and what an American hero he was in uh, Korea and uh, wounded and then held as a prisoner of war for 32 months and abused physically. Uh, But yet, when he could have went home, he went back to the fight. That's what I'm talking about tonight. We need that kind of spiritual backbone and that kind of spiritual unction uh, to go into these fights that we have in our life. And so the Lord prepares us and equips us for these battles that we'll face in our life by trials and by testing. That's how we're going to grow. So tonight, uh, I can tell you right now, I won't get done with it. Uh, but uh, we'll pick it up next week. That's one thing I love about preaching a series. It's like baloney. You can just cut it off the log wherever you want to. Just cut it off and just next week just start right back. Amen. And I got that from Brother Ernest. He used to always say all his preaching was baloney preaching. He'd just cut it off and pick it back up anywhere he wanted to. So, but, but tonight, what I want us to see, and maybe we'll cover two or three of these and we'll stop. But here in these first 12 verses of James, James is going to explain to us six reasons why the trials come into our life. Verses verses 2 to 12, there are six reasons there why he sends trials into our life. You might want to say it's six things that maybe the Lord is wanting to accomplish. Now let's look at them with me, would you? Look at verse number 2. We find the first reason. The first reason is that trials and tests happen in our life to produce joy. You say, well, that's kind of backwards, preacher. I've never got any joy out of, uh, of going through a trial. Well, I don't, uh, 
I don't, if, I don't enjoy going through trials. I don't, in the mornings when I pray, I don't say, Lord, lay it on me. You know, put me, put me through a trial. Lord, give me some trouble. I don't ask for that. I hope you don't ask for that either. It's going to come whether you ask for it or not. Uh, but I, th- I hope that you, you, that you don't ask for it. But I want you to notice he says in verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations. Now think about that for a minute. What's James trying to tell us? You see, joy, joy in our life, and as a child of God, we're supposed to have joy unspeakable and full of glory. That's the kind of joy that we're supposed to have. Jesus said before he went to be crucified, he said, these things have I spoken unto you that your joy might be full. So the Lord wants joy to be a large part of our life. Well, what does joy do for us when we're being tested and we're being tried? Well, here's a reason. Joy causes us to rejoice in the trial. Brother Roger preached a message for me one time over at New Birth in a revival. I'm sure he preached it here from the first chapter of Job. And the title of his message was, Worthy to be under the attack of Satan. Y'all remember that message? Worthy to be under the attack of Satan. I enjoyed that message. I don't remember every point of it, but I remembered what it was about and I enjoyed that. And so, you know, we can count it joy that we're even worthy to be put under a trial. You know, the Lord doesn't put something on you that you can't handle. He's not going to give you something that you can't get the victory over. Uh, He's not mean. He's not mean-spirited. He's a loving Father. But He has to test us. But He does it in a manner that He always makes a way of escape that we may be able to bear it. I want you to listen to uh, what Peter had to say in Acts chapter number 5 after they uh, had stood before the council, the Sanhedrin council, and after they had been beaten. Uh, and, and you know what they were beaten for? Preaching in the name of Jesus. You know why they were preaching in the name of Jesus? Because Peter said, we better obey God rather than man. And man said, don't preach in Jesus' name. Peter said, well, you go do whatever you want to do, and I'm going to do what I've got to do, and I'm going to preach in Jesus' name. But after they beat them, and turned them loose, the Bible says in Acts 5, 41, and they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were worthy to suffer shame for His name. There's where the joy comes in. The joy causes us to rejoice in the trial. They've been beaten with the scourge, and they're rejoicing because they were counted worthy. Another reason... Uh, that uh, trials and tests produce joy is that joy brings a rejoicing in our heart that better days lie ahead. Better days lie ahead. Hey, you know what? Everybody's got something going on in their life tonight. Amen. You don't even have to raise your hand. I don't believe there's a soul in here that don't have something going on in your life. Some kind of trial, some kind of a storm, some sort of an adversity that you're facing But let me tell you something, it's not always going to be like that. There are better days ahead. Listen to what uh, what Simon Peter said in his first epistle, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory, watch this, at the appearing of Jesus Christ. One day the trials and the troubles are going to be over. One day the pain and the sorrow and having to bury our loved ones, all that's going to be over. Hallelujah. And uh, we won't have to face that. We won't have to face the devil no more. And let me tell you something, when you know it's what's at the end of the road, boy, that can keep you going on down the road. Amen. I mean, when you know what's at the end of the road, you can take a lot on the trip. And so joy causes us to rejoice and Joy brings rejoicing of better days, but let me tell you something. Joy also gives us confidence that soon we'll see Jesus. No matter what happens, now I want you to listen to this verse carefully in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Now that's pretty self-explanatory, isn't it? 
He says, to be steadfast. You know, don't be a compromiser. Don't be a quitter. Stand fast. Be unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. But the last part of the verse says, For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, at, 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 at first glance, you would think that that's talking about our work that we do for the Lord. Actually, the phrase work in that verse and the word labor in that verse mean two totally different things. They don't mean the same thing. Uh, where it says to always abound in the work of the Lord, that does. That, 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 that talks about our, our physical labor, living for the Lord, serving the Lord, whatever the case may be. But he says, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now that word labor there in the Greek comes from the same word that we use for labor pain or labor, a woman in labor in childbirth. Now that puts a whole new light on that phrase. Now this is the last verse of 58 verses in 1 Corinthians 15. It's all about the resurrection. And he sums it up and says, go out, work for the Lord, labor for the Lord, stay in the fight, stay in the battle, don't quit, don't compromise, be steadfast. He said, but I want you to know something. He said, you're suffering and you're toiling and your pain that you deal with and the things that drag you down and cause you discomfort in your spiritual life. He said, stick with it. He said, because the Bible tells us that it'll be worth it all when we see Jesus. So we, we, we understand very clearly now, just from a few uh, proof text verses uh, out of the New Testament here, uh, that the trials and the testing of our faith, James was exactly right when he said, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, because it brings you rejoicing, and rejoicing of a, a better day in the future, and confidence that we will see Jesus. Keep on going on. So we don't ask for the trial, but we thank God for it. Because He uses that to bring us joy. Let me give you one more and we'll be go home. Second of all, look at verse number 3. He says, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. That's as far as we're going to get tonight. The trials and the testings are for the purpose of producing a steadfast faith. And that is, that is brought to pass by patience. Do you remember several weeks ago, on a Sunday morning I believe it was, I preached a message out of the book of Hebrews on you have need of patience. You remember that message? Well, if you don't, that word patience there means steadfastness. It means endurance and it means constancy. It is the characteristic of a man or a woman who is not swerved from his or her deliberate purpose and his or her loyalty to faith and piety or reverence by even the greatest trials and suffering. So based on that definition of the word patience right out of Strong's Concordance out of the, the Greek language in which it was written, we find that the, the second purpose for trials and testings is to produce a steadfast faith an enduring faith, a faith that won't stop, a faith that is consistent, that won't be on again, off again. You know, I mean, I could understand our faith being on again, off again if we had a limited atonement and we could lose our salvation and then had to go get it back and then lose it and then had to go get it back. I feel sorry for folks that believe that. 
That's not at all what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that salvation is a one-time eternal transaction. And it is not given to us based on how good we are. And we don't keep it based on how good we are. We're saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Plus nothing and minus nothing. It's all Him that does the work. But He wants our faith to be an enduring faith. He wants our faith to be a consistent faith. And He wants our faith to be an unflinching faith. Not many things should surprise a Christian. You see on the news, I couldn't believe it. Well, I can. First of all, I don't believe about 95% of what's out there. I don't care what channel you choose to use. Amen? I don't, I don't believe about 95% of any of it that I hear. And boy, if I did, I wouldn't come out of the house. Amen? Amen? I'd be afraid to come out from under the bed. Not that I can get under the bed, but... (laughs) My faith is not in my government. I respect my government, I pay my taxes, I obey its laws. I think a Christian ought to be the model of a citizen. Amen? But I don't, my faith's not in my government. I love all of you. I hope you know that. There's every one of you in here I love. And every one of you is just, you're equal in my eyes. We're one family. Amen? There's no big eyes and little U's. But I don't have no faith in you. Don't take that the wrong way. I don't place my faith in you. Because sure as I do, you'll let me down. And as sure as you put faith in me, I'll let you down. Our faith is in Jesus Christ. Unflinching. Unchanging. Russia can launch every nuclear missile they want to launch. My faith is in the Lord. I liked what my daddy used to say when I was a kid, you know, uh, growing up in the 60s. uh, We we lived in the age of... uh, bomb threats and threat of nuclear war and all that kind of stuff. You know, it was all the time. And I remember Daddy saying one time, he said, if they ever set off them nuclear missiles, he said, I hope the first one hits me right top of the head. Amen. I'm not worried about it, folks. The economists, the leading economists in the nation said before the end of March, we're going to be in a great recession. Might be. $10 for a gallon of gas. Could be. Could be. Might have to pay $20 for a dozen eggs and $15 for a loaf of bread. You know what you're going to do? You're going to buy it. That's exactly right. And my faith still going to be in the Lord. I, 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 I believe that, that He will take care of us. I believe with all of my heart He has saved my soul and He has sealed me with the Holy Spirit of promise and He's going to take me to heaven one day and I don't know what I'm going to face down here. Hallelujah. I don't know what trials and testings we'll go through, but praise God. He says, I want you to go through it with a steadfast faith. Count it all joy. And the trying of your faith work with patience. Now, we're going to stop right there. Next week, we'll pick her up with verse number four. Amen? And we'll go on down the road a piece. Don't be disheartened. This is only five chapter book, so... (laughs) Oh, my goodness. I tell you what, I preached through the book of Job one time at New Birth on Wednesday nights. I didn't think I was going to live through that. That was, that was really something. So, Amen. All right, let's bow our heads and be dismissed. The Father, thank you. We do thank you, Lord, when the trials and testings come because they don't come for our harm. They come for our good. And Lord, you're not, you're not trying to harm us or hurt us or cause us difficulties Lord you're just wanting us you're just wanting to see where we are you're wanting to find out Lord I, and I, you already know but you want us to know where we're standing And Lord we just pray that tonight we'll try to remember these first two things here that while trials come to produce joy and to produce a, 
an enduring faith. Lord, dismiss our service tonight with your grace. And Lord, we pray you bring us back on the Lord's Day. Bless those that's going to be traveling over the next few days. Give them safe travel to their destinations. And Lord, bless all of our folks on the prayer list. We love you and thank you. And watch over each one as they go home tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. God bless you for coming.